Welcome to Unheard Stories. I am Rubna Hassania, and I'm joining you from beautiful Southern California. I am very excited to introduce to you my guest, Dr. Charles al former director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, and vice president of the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Before we start, I would like to welcome and recognize the dignitaries sitting with us today. We have Ambassador Jean Macaron, Consul General Bashir Sarkis from LA, Councillor Mirna Khawli, and Honorable Judge Tony Raphael. Welcome everyone. Starry nights have always fascinated scientists, inspired artists, and enlightened philosophers. For thousands of years, their mystery has enriched our imagination and sparked our curiosity. Space will continue to taunt us for as long as we shall live. Its sheer enormity is beyond what our mind can grasp. But our understanding of it will keep growing for as long as we ask the right questions, aspire to break the record, and do what has never been done before. More than once, my guest today did just that. Dr. Al-Ashi was born in a remote village in Riyadh in the Bekaa Governorate of Lebanon. He grew up in a family that valued education. When he received the perfect score on the baccalaureate exam in both math and science, he was offered the fellowship to study engineering at l'Institut Polytechnique de Grenoble. So from his remote village in Bekaa to Beirut, where he boarded the ship to Alexandria, and from there to south of France to study under Louis Neyal in Grenoble, the 1970 Nobel laureate in physics. For his PhD program in electrical sciences, Dr. al picked Caltech for its sheer proximity to Hollywood, the capital of filmed entertainment, movies and movie stars he watched on TV growing up. Little did he know that NASA's JPL he read about growing up in Lebanon is connected to Caltech and that it would become his gateway to the stars, this time the real ones in the sky. Dr. al went from a summer job at JPL to serving as its director and as a vice president of Caltech for 16 years, during which he oversaw the development and operations of over 45 space flight missions and instruments. In 2016, the JPL NASA Mission Control Center was renamed the Charles al Mission Control Center. Dr. al has received more than 50 awards and honors, among them Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur from France in 2011 and the Lebanon Order of the Cedars in 2006. Dr. al is the recipient of an honorary doctorate from multiple universities and is a member of numerous advisory boards and councils. He authored 230 publications in the fields of active microwave remote sensing and electromagnetic theory. He's professor emeritus of electrical engineering and planetary science at Caltech, where he continues to pursue his research interests. So it's such a privilege to have him with us today. So let's go straight to him. Hello, Dr. al thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Lubna. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to see many of my friends and colleagues who are on the uh, online today. Yes, yes. Welcome. Dr. Lashi, the telescope has revolutionized the way we literally see the world around us. Its discovery can be traced back to the mid 9th century with the works of Al-Kindi and later Ibn al-Haytham, who developed the science of light and optics. 600 years later, Galileo turned his telescope to the sky and our solar system unfolded in front of his eyes, flipping long-held beliefs on their backs. Now, if Galileo is listening to you today, Dr. Lashi, what would you tell him? Oh, that would be interesting. He's probably up in heavens connected <laughs> to the internet. I didn't know they have it in heaven. No, I think, uh, as, as, as uh, probably most of you know, Galileo was the first person who actually saw the satellite of Jupiter. And that's why they were named the Galilean satellite. You know, they are Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. And then up at that time, everybody used to believe, particularly the church, that the earth was the center of the universe. Everything rotated around earth. So when Galileo saw that there are satellites around Jupiter, he started believing more with Copernicus theory that maybe actually 
it's uh, the sun which is at the center and the earth rotate around it like what's happening around Jupiter. And because he believed that, uh, the church uh, chastised him and he was uh, in home detention. So if I see him today, or if he's listening, I'll tell him, well, my dear friend Galileo, uh, you were right. You know, we have visited all those satellites that you discovered, you know, with our mission. And you are right, Earth is not the center of the universe. We actually rotate around the sun. And a matter of fact, over the next couple of years, both us at JPL, NASA, and the European will be sending spacecraft to study in detail the, the satellites of Jupiter. And uh, nobody asks us to stay at home, you know. So we are, a matter of fact, we are celebrated because we are doing that kind of thing. So hopefully he will feel better that he was right 400 years ago and, uh, and that people now celebrate, uh, you know, explorer like he was, you know, yes. an astronomer like he was. Yes, and we are definitely made to stride forward with people like you, Dr. Lashi. We're always driven by curiosity, ambition, and courage. So thank you for that. Sure, thank uh, you. When, when we were children, Dr. Lashi, we used to look up to the sky in awe with the glittering stars. But we also used to get terrified by the vast expanse of this black void. What do you see when you look up to the sky today? Do you still see it as mysterious as when you were a child? Yeah, oh no, no. When I look at the sky, I look at it as a beauty. You know, particularly if you look at images which are taken by telescope, because you can see billions and billions of galaxies and stars, and they are beautiful galaxies. I mean, I would urge uh, all the, the listeners to go and Google NASA and look at the images, particularly taken by the Hubble telescope now. And it's like paintings. It's like artists who have painted the sky with all these satellites. And in a few months, we'll start getting images from the Jim Webb telescope, which is going to be even more dramatic. You know, we think the first images will be coming in the May, June timeframe. So no, I mean, the sky is a beautiful place. I mean, one thing I remember uh, when we landed the uh, Curiosity, mm -hmm. you know, I went outside after we landed and were successful and everybody celebrated. I walked outside and it was in the evening. In actuality, it was when we landed Spirit. So I walked outside, it was in the evening and in the horizon, I could see Mars. Yeah. You know, it was everything dark was this bright, bright star. And I thought, wow, we humanity, we have just landed a rover on that planet. Yes. And that made me feel, you know, such big pride and so uplifting to see that and to know that we as, as a human, when we put our mind to do something, we can almost do anything. That's very true, Dr. Lashi, very true. Now, in, in, in 1976, you had a major breakthrough in your career that put you on the front cover of Science Magazine and National Geographic, also Scientific America. Archaeologists were so thrilled with what you discovered, and so did NASA. Can you tell us a little bit about that, the story of that? Yeah, well, that was an exciting thing. I was a young scientist at that time, and I was selected, me and my team, we were competitively selected to put the first scientific instrument on the space shuttle. It was the first space shuttle flight, and it was an imaging radar. That's kind of my technical. Uh, you don't need to know the detail of it, but it provides images very similar to camera, except we use radio wave, you know, like what we are communicating now through the internet. And what we were able to do is to take images over dry region in the Sahara. And the radar was able to penetrate and take images of what's below the surface. Mm -hmm. It's in a similar way when if you are inside the building, you still can hear your radio. So the waves actually can penetrate through the walls. And what we saw, we saw drainage channels all over North Africa. And that was fascinating. And to make a long story short, what it turned out is we were imaging the rivers which existed, the dry bed of the river which existed a few thousand years ago during the pharaohs and before the pharaohs. And then because of the climate change, that whole area got covered with sand. So when we look in our eyes or when we visit, uh, we just see sand. You know, while in reality, just below that, are the traces of the drainage channels which existed in the past. So that was a big discovery and there was a lot of interest by geologists and particularly by archeologists because mm -hmm. they, uh, they said that most likely old cities and old caravan you know, passes were along where the rivers were. And that led, we did similar work in Oman and that led to the discovery of the ruin 
of what's called the city of Ubar, which mm -hmm. is mentioned in the Bible. That's where you get frankincense, you know, from. So that led to being on the front cover of Science Magazine. Uh, a lot of the awards I received in my younger age were because of that. And that put me on a track to become the director of JPL. That yeah. was a very exciting time. Yes, indeed. And you had a second breakthrough, actually, right? In the mid 90s, when you ended up revolutionizing topographic mapping. Yeah. So yeah. the same technique, you know, there was a shuttle radar. We kind of developed it and became more and more and more advanced. And then we developed what we call radar interferometry. So that means we have two antennas, mm -hmm. uh, like your eyes. Mm -hmm. So you can see from two different perspectives. Uh, and to make a long story short, was one shuttle flight, which was about like 15 days, we mapped the whole world and were able to generate digital topographic map. So today, when you see topographic map of any place or the perspective pictures, like when you see the weather report coming over Los Angeles and you see the 3D images, that all came from that mission, you know, that we have done. So it's now being, it's used by pilots, like when you are flying at night, if you can connect you know, over a remote area, you can see the scene in front of you, even that it's night and it's not visible or if it's yes. cloudy, you can see that in three dimension. So it had a lot of impact, you know, across the board in many areas, both for hikers, as well as for weather report, as well as for, uh, for uh, uh, pilots. Uh, and that was another major breakthrough which happened, you know, in the mid nineties. Yes, that's, that's remarkable work, Dr. Lashi. We're so proud of you. In 2001, you became director of JPL and vice president of Caltech. And that ushered what you called the golden age of space exploration. During your tenure, uh, 24 missions were launched into space, which puts it at an average of one mission every nine months. And that's, they were all successful. And that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, can you take us to Saturn, Dr. Lashi? It's three planets away from planet Earth. You called it the most beautiful planet. Why is it the most beautiful? And what are we learning from exploring Saturn? Well, to go, to go back a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the people who are not familiar, JPL is about 7,000 researchers, and I call them 7,000 explorers. And basically what we do is to actually explore the universe you know, by sending spacecraft, telescopes, all, all across uh, the universe. And, you know, each planet has its beauty. Mm -hmm. But no question, when you are back, you know, uh, let's say on a spacecraft around Jupiter or around Mars, and you look back, you see that little dot that we call Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's, we call it the blue dot. You know, Carl Sagan started that word. Because it's a dot where really it's the right environment for life. And it's beautiful. You know, sometimes people always ask me, would you like to go and live on another planet? And I think, well, I love to explore the planet, but I really like it here because it's such a beautiful place. And one of our key objective is to explore Mars, which is the nearest planet to us. Uh, it's not as pretty as Earth, but scientifically it's very interesting. And the reason it's very interesting and we send all these rovers to Mars is we believe in the early days of Mars, a few billion years ago, it was similar to Earth that mm -hmm. both Earth and Mars were about very similar, that there was water on Mars because we see traces of rivers and we see frozen ice on Mars. And for some reason, Mars kind of the water froze while on Earth here, the life evolved on it. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to understand why did that happen? And is there in the early days on Mars, could have life started on Mars? And if it did, is it similar or is it different to Earth? And of course, I don't think we'll, we'll think of life that people like us living now, but there might be at the cell level, some mm -hmm. remnant of the early days on Mars. And, and if we find it, that would be something amazing because that would say there is life somewhere else. Mm -hmm. on, and on other places, Europa, which potentially have ocean and it might have life on it. So our quest of exploration is really to know how did we come about? Why did life evolve here on Earth, but not at least on Mars? We don't see it you know, today. And if it evolved, is it similar or different? Mm -hmm. It did not evolve. Why not? Why did it evolve only here on Earth? So it's really a very important intellectual thing for all of us mm -hmm. to know where is our origin and how did we evolve on this beautiful planet, you know, to be here, you and I having this conversation in mm -hmm. here. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. 
Yeah, definitely. But Saturn has something very particular to it. You know, all these uh, uh, clouds uh, encircling it. And it, it's kind of given us an information about the formation of a, of a solar system, right? Yeah. Well, you know, each planet is somewhat different. Mm -hmm. and, it's, uh, and, and that's great because that allows us to look at different perspective and different things. So, uh, and, and one thing which is very interesting now is with our telescope, when we look at other stars, we find that almost every star has planets around them. Uh -huh. uh, some of them bigger than Earth, some of them smaller, some of them go in different orbits. So clearly there are planets all across the universe. Uh -huh. And by looking at other solar system and our solar system, it will give us an insight about how did the solar system form? How did it start from what we call a, a, a cloud, uh -huh. which collapsed and formed the sun, and then the dust around, around the sun uh, actually led to forming small object and bigger and bigger and led to forming the planet, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, that we know today. So it's really looking, we look at the solar system as an experiment, like you are in the lab trying to form a solar system and to understand how did that all form and evolve. Yeah, so, so we expect all this cloud to basically collapse into bigger uh, satellites and start well, orbiting Saturn at one point. It, it could be, it could be because as uh, you know, it's a dynamic solar system, but again, we're talking about hundreds of millions of years. It's yes. not like tomorrow something is going to happen. And, and particularly by looking at other solar system, looking at planets around other stars, yes. it will be at different ages. So that means it will show us what our solar system looked at different times yes. in its evolution. Uh, yeah. So in a sense, it will give us like what I'd call a movie of how our solar system, you know, actually formed. And as we are building bigger and bigger telescope like the Jim Webb and more sensitive telescope, we'll be able to see more and more the details of how those solar system have evolved and how their cloud, which are around the yeah. sun collapsed and created, you know, planet. So it's going to be a fascinating next decade or two decades that yeah. we'll be exploring. Yes. So we talked a little bit about life uh, on a different planet. Um, and I, I, at this point in our solar system, we're looking at um, primitive form of life, right? Yeah. Uh, what, 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 uh, what is a prerequisite for life on a planet? Is it, well, what, do you, what do you look for? Well, um, I mean, the best life we know is our life here. Uh -huh. And we understand, at least our belief now, is that life on this planet formed because there was water, organic material, and energy. Uh -huh. And that allowed the organic material to float in the water. And because of the energy, they made bigger and bigger molecule and then led to cells. And that's what led to life, you know, over billions of years through the evolution. So that's kind of what we are looking for on other planets. So on, and the two key targets are Mars, and Europa, which is a satellite of Jupiter. And there is also Enceladus, which is satellite of, uh, of uh, Saturn. Uh -huh. And what were in the case of Mars, we believe that in the past, there uh -huh. used to be water, uh -huh. there was energy because we see volcanoes, the sun illuminate the surface, and we have detected some organic material with our rovers. So the key question that we had the same ingredient which led to life here, could those ingredients have started you know, life on Mars. And then through evolution, it probably it died away. But Europa is even more exciting because we believe that Europa is a satellite about the size of our moon. Uh -huh. It has ice on the surface, similar to the ice that you have in your drink. Uh -huh. uh, we see organic material on the surface. And because we see fracturing like we see in the polar region on Earth, we think there is an ocean just below the surface uh -huh. made of water. So uh -huh. here again, you have the combination of recipes for life. You have water, liquid water, you have energy because of the tide, you know, on Europa and we see organic material. So we are planning a mission which will be launched two years from now, it's being built at JPL now, which will go to Europa and sound the ice to see how deep that ice is like we do in the Arctic and Antarctic, find out where is the thinnest area. And then we're planning to send a lander which will land on the surface drill its way through the ice and then send a submarine in the ocean on Europa. And who knows what we will see? 
if it would look like our ocean or would look a different ocean. And that would be another fascinating thing. So now people who are kind of uh, very imaginative say, well, life could be different, you know, than the life here. And that could be, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And we might find something very different. Life might not be based on carbon chains. It might okay. be based on silicon, uh -huh. you know, so, so it's, it's all fascinating. It's an area of new discoveries that will happen in the next few decades about what is life and what do you look for? So far, we are looking only at things that we are familiar with because that's the only one we know. Yes. And, and we talked about Mars and the possibility of having a life on it some many, many years ago. What do you think led to drying up of Mars? Why, why does it not, why isn't it similar to ours? It's so close to us. We started at the same point in evolution, you know, 4 billion years ago, planet Earth and planet Mars started together. What, what, what made Mars diverse so much from planet Earth? Yeah, I mean, that is a very great, PhD thesis, that, <laughs> and, and there are a number of theories, yes. but one of the theory which kind of makes sense to know that Mars is smaller than Earth. Yeah. Therefore, the core of Mars is smaller, and that's what generates heat. You know, okay. on Earth, that's why you have volcanoes, you have plate tectonics. So on Mars, it turned out that Mars cooled down much faster than Earth mm -hmm. done that, and that led to the freezing you know, of, uh, you know of, uh, of the water. Plus it's a little bit farther away, so it's not as warm as we have here. So that's one of the theories, the fact that its size was mm -hmm. smaller than Earth, uh, led it to cool off much faster, you know, than Earth. So that's one of the theories that why Mars, we think that life might have started at the beginning when it was warm, but then it cooled down because of its size. Okay. So we are lucky about the size of our planet Oh, yeah. stayed warm here. Several things we're lucky about the albedo, how it, it reflects lights, the atmosphere and its composition, the magnetic field, right? Okay. All that. Um, for the sheer number of suns in our galaxy, Dr. al -Ashi, and of the number of galaxies in the universe, it becomes extremely likely to have another planet somewhere in this universe that supports intelligent life life as we know it. How far are we from te technologically from finding such thing? Well, we, we are not very far. Uh, and you are right. I mean, when we, as I mentioned earlier, when we look with our telescopes uh, and we do measurement of the different stars, we literally see almost every star has planets around it. Mm -hmm. And so far, we have not been able to image those planets, but we can measure their period, their impact on the star by wobbling, looking at the wobble, we can measure their mass. We can have some idea about their atmosphere. But mm -hmm. as we move ahead with bigger and bigger telescope, like the Jim Webb telescope, like the big telescope that Caltech is building in Hawaii, you know, 30 meter telescope, mm -hmm. I think, and, and using technique, which we call coronograph, which is basically blocking the light from the star. So we see what around it. It's like when, you are with an audience and the light is shining in your face. You put your hand to block the light, then you can see people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the dark. It's exactly the same technique that we, we call it coronagraph. And we're going to be flying a number of those over the next decade. So that's hopefully will allow us to take direct images of the different stars. And then the next step we'll be looking at is what is their atmosphere made of? Does it have oxygen in it? Does it have methane in it? What's the temperature? you know, in there. Uh, do we see changes in the atmosphere? That will tell us that there are clouds and so on. So, so we start looking at planets which would be similar to Earth, you know, because that will be more possibilities that life could have evolved on them. And then the other aspect of it, a number of people now or researchers are looking with radio telescope to see can we receive any signals from them. I mean, here on Earth, as you know, we have TVs, we have radars, uh, we have internet communicating, GPS satellite. So we're radiating microwave all across, you know, out from Earth. So if there is a life which is evolved like us, probably they are doing the same thing. They probably have a Hollywood, you know, somewhere there. Probably they are sending, transmitting, uh, not, not necessarily on purpose. They could be done being the transmission. And we should be able to detect that. Yes. Now, it will take a while for the signals to get here. The nearest star to us. Uh, is basically about what we call four light years 
That means if there is any transmission at that star, it will take four years to reach us at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So if we see a planet which looks similar to Earth, probably a lot of telescope would be pointing toward that planet to see, do we get any signal from it? Now, traveling there, that's a much tougher situation because it will take a big advance in propulsion to yes. be able to get very, very fast, like almost the speed of light to get there within a reasonable time. But who knows? You yeah. know, it might be science fiction today for our kids and grandkids that might become reality. You know. yeah. Will we be able to travel to Mars sometime soon? Uh, yeah, I would say we have all the technology now to be able to do a trip to Mars. Uh, it will take about nine months to get there. You have to spend some time there, nine months to come back. So a big challenge is you have to take all your food, you have to take all your medicine, and you have to be in a little capsule with four or five other people. You know, it's kind of, it will be psychologically challenging. Just imagine you are sitting in a room, a small room with half a dozen people, and you have to spend the next two years you know, <laughs> with them. So, so, uh, so the space station, we're doing a lot of experiments to see how does that affect psychologically? How does it affect our physiology you know, on doing that? And then the other part, what we're doing with the rover that we have on Mars now, we're te testing technology to extract oxygen from the atmosphere because it's made of carbon dioxide and to extract water from below the surface you know, by melting you know, the ice. So we don't have to take all of that with us. That will simplify things. So I would have to project that within the next 20 years, I think we will be able to travel to Mars and do like what was in the movies of Martian. Yeah. You know, so that movie is reasonably realistic. You know, yeah. uh, Matt Damon and Jessica Chastain, you know, did a pretty good job. It was dramatized, but yeah. it's pretty realistic. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all good work and that's all exciting to look forward to. Um, Dr. Lashi, there is another moon that's very interesting that you're also focusing on and that's titan um and that's a moon that uh, orbits around saturn can you tell us a little bit what we're learning from that moon yeah no that's one of the largest moons in the solar system and it's one of the few moons matter of fact the only real moon which have an atmosphere mm -hmm. and the pressure on it is about the same pressure as here on earth uh, to compare like on Mars, the pressure is only 1%. So you cannot go outside, you know, and breathe. It's like you are flying at very high altitude. So Titan has an atmosphere, it has cloud, and it's heavily with methane. Uh -huh. and the reason that's interesting is that methane, uh, you know, is carbon. So it's similar to the organic, uh, the foundation of organic material. And when we did the mission called Cassini, I had an imaging radar instrument, you know, that I developed. And we took images you know, of the surface of Titan through the clouds. And we could see lakes and rivers, uh, you know, today, you know, we see lakes and rivers, except because Titan is so cold, it's so far away from the sun, the water is all frozen. So the rocks on Titan is made of water and the lakes and the river, they are made of liquid methane. So it's similar to the gasoline you put in your car because that can stay liquid at very, very low temperature. So here you have a, a satellite or a planet which have rivers of petroleum and, and lakes of petroleum. I tell people, but it's very expensive to get the petroleum back here. So it's not going to affect the price of gasoline. And kiddingly, I tell people, if you light a match, the whole planet will blow away. Mm -hmm. uh, but who knows, there could be some kind of life you know, on it. As a matter of fact, NASA is planning by end of this decade to send a mission to Titan and have an airplane fly in the atmosphere or a drone fly in the atmosphere of Titan and explore Titan in more detail. So who knows, that's an era of discovery which will happen in the early thirties. Yes. Have we explored all the planets, Dr. Lashi, in our solar system already? Do we pretty much have some information on each one of them? Yep, no, we have, uh, by now we have visited, just imagine, when I was a student and came to Caltech, we only had been to a couple of planets. You know, we had been just flew by Venus and just flew by Mars. Mm -hmm. Today, we have visited every planet in our solar system. Some of them we did flybys. Some of them we went in orbit. So we spent a lot of time analyzing them in detail. And some of them, like in the case of Titan, we had a lander. In the case of Mars, P2 
people don't appreciate that, but something that people can be proud of. For the last 14 years, we have been roving on Mars every day, every hour, every week on that planet, you know, carrying the American flag. So here you are on, literally, we have been exploring another planet every day roving around it. You know, we all, you know, we had first spirit and opportunities and curiosity, now perseverance. And on top of that, on perseverance, we actually deployed a drone. So we have flown, so we did what I call the Wright Brothers moment on another planet. The first time we actually fly on another planet. So yes, we have explored all of them, some of them more detailed than others. Mm-hmm. And have we explored outside the solar system? Uh, so clearly we have, discovered, we have explored them by telescopes. Yes. We, we see a lot. There. But also, if you recall the Voyager spacecraft, which we launched at JPL in 1976. Mm-hmm. And that spacecraft flew by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, and, uh, and Neptune. And it's still flying. It has left our solar system. So we are outside the bubble of our, and we still communicate with it. Mm -hmm. That shows the amazing technology that we have developed, you know, with our uh, telecommunication. Mm -hmm. So that spacecraft, it's now 46 years or 47 years. It's still working. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's using technology of uh, of the 1970s. And we still resist. So when I go to the mission control center, you know, we, we, that's where we receive the signals from all the different spacecraft. Every once in a while, you see a signal coming from Voyager. And the amazing part is when we see the signal coming from it and the information, that signal was transmitted two days ago. Mm-hmm. That's how long it takes at the speed of light from outside our solar system for the signal to arrive here. So yeah, we're, we're moving beyond our solar system <laughs> with our robot and our spacecraft. Yes, that's true. Just- um, Dr. Al Ashi, you talked about the seven minutes of terror. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really that terrorizing those seven minutes? Yeah, there, there are seven minutes of terror, and I believe me because I was in the mission operation room. So, mm-hmm. so these are when we are entering the atmosphere of Mars and landing our rover. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the signal from Mars takes about ten minutes to arrive to Earth. So, when we say we have reached the top when we get the signal saying we reach the top of the atmosphere, in actuality, we have landed. And Mm -hmm. we don't know if we crashed or safely landed. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we call them the seven minutes of terror is here you work for like eight, 10 years developing this spacecraft and this rover, hundreds and hundreds of people dedicate their career, you know, to do that. And we are coming at the top of the atmosphere with energy, what I call energy, equivalent to 140,000 race car going at full speed because we're coming extremely fast and we slam in the top of the atmosphere and we have seven minutes to slow down and land softly on the surface. So first we use a heat shield, similar to like when you are in your car and you stick your hand out, you feel the pressure of the air. So that slows us down. Then we drop the heat shield, open a parachute bigger than any parachute ever built at supersonic speed. Then as we come closer to the surface, we have to fire retro rockets. And then when we are at about like 20 meters above the surface, then we get to zero velocity. And then we sky crane the rover slowly to the surface. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get damaged on it. So there are literally hundreds of events which have to happen all autonomously. Because you cannot joystick it because of time delay. Mm -hmm. And if one of them doesn't work, the mission is failed. So you can see the tension. You have eight years of your life are in front of you. Everything depends on those seven minutes. Everything has to work perfectly. And and it's it's an amazing feeling because as you see different events happening, you can start feeling really better, a little bit better. And and then when you land and uh, the the signal says we have safely landed, you know, there is excitement. So again, I urge people to go and look at the JPL website and look at the seven minutes of terror or the landing of curiosity or perseverance. Uh, every time I see it, yeah, and I show it at every presentation, I look at it like once a week, my heartbeat goes up even now. And I know the outcome that it's successful. Yeah. The excitement and, and it shows you the amazing things that people, when they work together, what they can accomplish, you know, on the way there. So 
that's what makes exploration so exciting. Definitely. And the fact that you cannot follow it in real time, you just have to imagine that it's happening. And then once you know, it's already done. That's right. Yeah. God knows, and maybe Galileo knows. Galileo knows. have to wait 10 minutes to find out. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all good work, Dr. Lashi. How real is climate change here for us on planet Earth? Can you quantify the risk we are facing today with climate change? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that uh, question, Lubna, because that's really a very important topic. In addition to sending spacecraft across the solar system, we also have spacecraft in Earth's orbit monitoring what's happening on our planet. Uh, matter of fact, as you mentioned earlier, my first science experiment was looking at Earth and yeah. looking at the rivers, uh, the old rivers in, uh, in North Africa. And we have seen changes happening on our planet. They are happening slowly, but they could have a big impact. And let me give you a couple of examples. We are seeing that the ocean is rising at the rate of few millimeters per year. And we have been monitoring it for 30 years. So on that rate in 40, 50 years, uh, many areas you know, around the world will be flooded you know, mm -hmm. because of that ocean rise. And you will say, what's the reason of it? Why is the ocean? And we found that it's coming from two reasons. One, the surface temperature is steadily increasing. And as the temperature increases, the water expands a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that accounts for half of that rise. Mm -hmm. The other factor is because of the temperature change, the ice in Greenland and Antarctica is melting and dumping water literally hundreds of gigaton per year uh, into the ocean. So that adds to the increase. So really the temperature change which is happening has a broad you know, impact on that. Plus it impacts the weather. It impacts the hurricane formation. It impacts the dynamic of the atmosphere. And we know for a fact that the increase in the temperature is coming because of the carbon dioxide and the methane we are emitting in the atmosphere. And that's what we call it the greenhouse effect. So it's similar to if you leave your car in the sun and you go and have your ice cream or whatever you are doing, and then you come back, the car inside is warmer than outside. And the reason is the sunlight goes through the glass, through the windows, heats the inside. And then when the energy or the heat is trying to get out, the, the glass is uh, opaque does not let heat coming out from the car. That's exactly what carbon dioxide and methane do to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. The sunlight comes in, warms the surface, and when the heat is trying to get out to escape to space, it blocks it. I mean, carbon is a molecule of carbon dioxide and methane block it. So it's very important, you know, to be able to, uh, to be conscientious about what we are doing to our atmosphere and that's what's leading to the change. One thing I would urge again the audience is go and Google. Uh, uh, we have a uh, an app called Eyes on Earth. If you Google it, you can get to it. And basically, what it shows you is the data from every satellite we have in almost real time within 24 hours of what's happening on our planet. So effectively, it's giving you access to the mission operation room at JPL. So you can see where the carbon dioxide is, how it's changing over time. And you can play the past because we have it all in the, in the records. So you can go back and see what has changed over the last decade. So, and, and matter of fact, for if there are people in Lebanon uh, or the Middle East listening, we have worked recently with the Saudi Arabian uh, colleagues, you know, their space agency to make it also in Arabic. So the same thing, you can see it in English, the same images, you see the planet rotating and the satellite, and you can see it also in Arabic if that's what you prefer to do. So it's called eyes on earth. So it's like our eyes on earth. Yes. yes. And, and you can have it on your iPhone. Yeah. So you can impress your friend to show them, look, that's where the heat is. Uh, that's where carbon dioxide and monoxide and methane across the planet. And be engaged with it. Dr. Lashi, have you seen a slowdown in these curves or are we still going up in destruction? No, unfortunately, it's still going up, uh, but, but there is hope, you okay. know, particularly with all the international agreement of using more green energy and so on. So there is hope that at least we can stabilize it. It's going to take a long time because uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a lifetime of tens of years. Uh -huh. So even if we stop emitting everything today, there is still going to be some effect, you know, of heating with the carbon dioxide. But as of now, it's still going up. 
So again, I hope that, uh, you know, with all the awareness now about the impact to our atmosphere and what's happening to our planet, uh, and, and I think it doesn't require only the government. I mean, the government is important, but even ourselves, you know, in our own little way of how if everyone contribute a little bit about reducing the carbon dioxide, that could make a big difference, you mm -hmm. know, but, but it's still an issue and we, we ought to be very conscientious about it. Yeah, we definitely do have to be conscientious. Um, and all the, all, all the uh, facts you're bringing us are irrefutable facts. You have to take it very seriously. Yeah. Dr. Lashi, the two pillars of 20th century physics were Einstein's general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. What do you expect those of the 21st century would be? Where are we heading? <laughs> Well, I mean, there are, I mean, it's amazing how science and technology is evolving, yeah. you know, they, how fast it's moving. I mean, awesome. let me give you one simple example, uh, the vaccine for the coronavirus. I mean, within nine months, we were able to get a vaccine for it. I mean, that was amazing, you know, that, that, that development that have happened. Now, it didn't start from scratch. People have been doing a lot of research on mRNA, you know, mm -hmm. which uh, became the technique that we used for the vaccine. So that shows you the amazing speed of evolution of science and how it's impacting us in our life. If we didn't have that science, we would have been all in deep, in deep trouble. So I would see major evolution happening in biology. I would see major evolution happening in, in space technology, space travel, space tourism, all happening in the next you know, decade. And then trying to understand some of the fundamental uh, in our universe. Like now we talk about dark energy and black, uh, black matter. Uh, what really it is, is things that we don't understand. That's yeah. why we come up with these fancy names. You know, that's what scientists uh -huh. tend to do. Because we find that, for instance, uh, we see that the universe is expanding. I mean, we can measure that. Uh -huh. The expectation is, simplistic expectation is that it should go back and collapse because the gravity will bring it back. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it that it's not only expanding, but it's accelerating. Yeah. But there is a negative gravity, which is pushing it away instead of bringing it back in. We don't understand what that is made of. Mm -hmm. When we look at galaxies, which are spinning, mm -hmm. the speed of their spinning give us indication we think they should basically, like when you spin, you know, you kind of, uh, uh, you have force, gravity force outward. We see that that's not happening. So mm -hmm. that, that there is some matter that we cannot see which is attracting them. Mm -hmm. so, so I think there is going to be a lot of fundamental understanding of what the universe is made of. Yes. So, so on a full scale from biology, what our body is made of, you know, all the, how it functions and hopefully come with capability to, to cut down on many of the diseases or find solutions for them all the way to understanding the universe. Mm -hmm. So I would say the next, 20, 30, 40 years. I just wish I was younger so I can see all this development that is happening around us and the knowledge and the technology that we get. Yes, uh, we have to figure out what all these forces are you just talked about. You know, maybe there are forces we're not aware of and then find a way to consolidate them. Yeah. And that and, will understand the universe. <laughs> and, and, and one thing I would, uh, again, for the audience, I gave the, the vaccine as an example of how science is affecting our life. Yes. One example I always take, I have my iPhone sitting next to me here. Mm -hmm. I'm sure none of you can live without an iPhone today. And the iPhone has a, cameras. I'm sure all of you have those cameras. People don't appreciate that the focal plane of that camera was developed at JPL for our telescopes. And then an entrepreneur can say, you know, I can put that in an iPhone. So that's a simple example of how investment in technology, in this case, space technology, has had direct impact on all of us, you know, by having developing the iPhone and developing the cameras in the iPhone. So science has a big impact on our, not only our life, but our economic well-being, you know, also. Definitely. And, it, you know, it takes hundreds of years of diligent work by the greatest human minds to be where we are today. Yep. Um, Dr. Charles al -Ashi, thank you for sharing your insights with us. I'd like to now open the floor for the audience if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, for all of those who wish to ask Dr. al a question, please leave it in the chat box or raise your hand using the reactions button on the bottom of the screen. 
me see what we have here. Um, Farid Makarim to everyone, in your opinion, is there any hope that intelligent life is discovered on a distant planet within the next 50 years? <laughs> yeah, that is possible. I mean, it could happen almost any time. If, if, uh, and, and it's a discovery will be, I mean, two ways. One is if we see signals coming, you know, uh, radio, radio signals, and we have telescopes and a number of organizations listening and looking, and, and the challenge is naturally many stars in the world, they transmit radio wave. The key question is to separate that signal from a signal coming from an intelligent life. So it has to be, have a certain pattern and repetitiveness to it. So that could happen anytime. Yeah. Now, more directly by imaging, as I mentioned earlier, I would say within the next 10 years, we'd be able to see a wide spectrum of planets and if some of them are similar to Earth. Of course, we'll be focusing on the stars, which are the closest, you know, to us, because that's where we get the best signal, you know, from them. So yeah, I would say that within the next decade, it's very likely we will know, it doesn't mean we'll communicate with them, you mm -hmm. know, or, or have an iPhone conversation with them, but we'll be able to say, hey, there are these planets which are very similar to our planet and possibly there is life on it. And depend if, we're, for instance, if we detect that there is in their atmosphere. If we detect a molecule of CFCs, that's what's emitted from your refrigerator, mm -hmm. that molecule is not natural. We generated it you know, through our chemistry. So if we detect that in the atmosphere, that tell us that there is chemical activity done by humans on those other planets. So we will learn a lot by looking at the signal, both natural signal as well as radio transmission. So mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we might, we might find that all that science fiction you see in Hollywood, in actuality, might be real. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, we have a question from His Excellency uh, Ambassador Jean Macaron. Go ahead. Hi, Charles. Hi, John. How are you doing? Uh, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, really, it is uh, indeed uh, interesting to listen to you. And it is good to see you after a long time. <laughs> I have two questions. One sentimental and the second is philosophical. Sentimental, what are the best memories you have of your days in Rayyad Haushal? Ah, okay. <laughs> the place, the place yeah. you grew up in, in Lebanon. Second question, NASA spent billions of dollars to discover the planet world. What are some of the most significant and concrete benefits humanity has gained from this achievement in space? Thank you. Sure. And uh, my, my best regard to Pierre and to, Gal to Valérie. Don't forget. <laughs> thank you. I'll tell her that. Uh, uh, thank you. No, I mean, uh, my memories in Lebanon are always exciting and very good. Uh, you know, I grew up in Raya, beautiful valley, you know, in there. Uh, I remember one thing I still even remember today is usually in September, it starts raining a little bit and you smell the earth. I still yes. have that smell in my nose you know, here every day. I mean, I have that memory that I have. And all my experience were great. All my friends, uh, the schools I went to, to the college, the Zapat, to the Madrasi uh, Shari, you know, in, in Zahli. Uh, and there was a nun school, which is next to our house in Raya, uh, you know, that I went to. So I would say I have great memories from almost everything in Lebanon. I have great memories with. I feel very sad to see the economic situation today because it's such a beautiful country and such beautiful people, you know, that we have in Lebanon. And I feel very sad to see all the, all the bad things which are happening. Now on your second question, we really gained two things from space. I mean, at, at, the, at the high level. One is the intellectual knowledge that we have. Uh, again, when we were young, we had no idea what the planets look like other than what we see you know, uh, you know, the little dot. So gaining that knowledge and understanding how the planets form and how does that impact our own planet? Like how do hurricanes actually form? How does the weather, you know, change? All that came from observing other planets. And the other one is the technological advances. As I mentioned earlier, you know, with my iPhone, many people don't appreciate that when you are using your location, the reason you get your location is because of satellites we have in orbit called GPS network. People think that it's coming from inside the, the iPhone or it's coming from a tower. 
Now you get your location because of the satellites that we have, uh, the communication we're having, you know, that was developed through a lot of uh, space activities. As I mentioned, the camera in your iPhone. Uh, today, many people are doing the remote surgery, you know, with, with the robotics. That arm that does the surgery is based on the arms that we have developed for the rover on Mars. So these are just some small examples of how the technology and the advances that we did in space, then entrepreneur took that technology and are applying it to better our life here. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Lashi. Thank you, Ambassador. We're going to go to Professor Mary Hani. Hello, May. Hello. Good to see you all. Um, Dr. Lashi, first, I want to thank you for enriching our knowledge and for making us value more curiosity and exploration. And my question to you is the following. Uh, as we all know, Lebanon is going through an existential crisis of many dimensions, including the economic dimension. And part of that crisis is electricity. Do you think, you the scientist, you the wise man, that if, if Lebanon goes to the source of solar panels for electricity, can Lebanon solve that problem? Well, it, uh, I'm not sure it will solve the full problem because part of the problem, as you know, <clears throat> is not technological, it's really more political, you know, mm -hmm. and economic. But mm -hmm. clearly, I think if we can do, use more solar energy in Lebanon yeah. or anywhere around the world, that yeah. will happen tremendously. Because yeah. now you can, if you have like the solar panels at your home, yeah. then you are not dependent on any other factors you know, uh, particularly political. Now you also, it will not be sufficient to have only solar panel at home. You need also what we call solar farms. So it needs companies to do that. So you can get more, more energy. So yes, what you said, it really, by using solar energy, it addresses two things. I mean, one, it will resolve partially the, the electricity issue, but number two, it will help with the green, you know, the green energy, yes. as I was mentioning right. earlier, instead right, right. of using petroleum and so on. So right. it's a double win. That yeah. that. And I have seen, I was looking at the internet and I have seen some people are starting to put solar, solar mm -hmm. energy. <laughs> now, I want to say one thing, uh, uh, the, cause you mentioned earlier about curiosity. Yes. So I was reading a quote today, which I loved and I want to share it with you. And it said, we don't lose curiosity because we get old. We become old because we lose curiosity. Lovely, lovely, so lovely, I thought, absolutely. I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful. Lovely, <laughs> lovely, and very true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for your question, May. Um, I'm gonna go to a question by Dr. Regina. She's saying, what is the one thing that you would like to be remembered for by the future generations to come when your name is mentioned, Dr. Lashi? <laughs> ah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, no, all, 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 the, probably the best thing I would like to be remembered for is that I helped enhance the knowledge of humanity. <clears throat> and I helped nurture more curiosity, you know, on, uh, and, and, uh, and let me tell you why I think that's very important. For the young people today, curiosity is very important. And for the old people, like I said, the quote, uh, because as a human, if we lose our curiosity and our imagination, we really don't become humans anymore. You know, I mean, or we don't are the same humans we have today. So really curiosity and, and uh, enriching and lighting that curiosity is very important. And I think the work that I have doing at JPL by exploring the planet and uh, really led to do, to get us more of the curiosity, to enrich that curiosity. And there is a quote that you had in your video at the beginning, you know, from Teddy Roosevelt, which is my favorite quote, which is, uh, to dare mighty things. And it says, it's far better to dare mighty things, even if it checkered with failure, than to sit in the twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. And that became the logo of JPL, dare mighty things. And that's my message to the people who are listening and particularly the young people, is that we should always try to push the state of knowledge, even if we might fail. Mm -hmm. But it's important that we keep trying and we push the limit of knowledge. So hopefully I will be remembered that, you know, Charles 
really help pushing the, the limit of knowledge and re enriched our lives. Well, thank you for all that you do, Dr. Rashi. We have a question from Rafi Muhtar. Go ahead, Rafi. Hey, good morning, Dr. Rashi. Hi, Rafi. It's an honor. It's an honor to be listening to you this morning and learn about your scientific discoveries. You. As thank a Lebanese-American like yourself, I personally, and I know I speak to a lot of people, we're very proud of you and your accomplishments. Uh, I have many questions. I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer myself, <laughs> an aerospace engineer. I have many questions about space, but I want to limit my questions. There isn't enough time, just Earth. Uh, we know we all, uh, Dr. Lubna, thank you for asking the question about climate change. And that's all very important to all of us. Now, uh, the question is like twofold. First, uh, do you believe it's mainly caused by the burning of fossil fuels or there are other things also that are impacting it? The second question is, you know, some of our politicians, though we may not care about their opinion, but they hold the purse strings and don't believe in climate change. They be some believe it's a hoax. So can science do more to convince the people so that at least uh, there will be funds available so we can do things and help fight climate change or slow it down at least? Yeah, Rafiq, that's a very good question. You know, when I was a director of JPL, I had to interact a lot with politicians. Uh, so I used to go regularly to Washington and meet with senators and congressmen to tell them what we do and what we are contributing. Because after all, we are funded by the taxpayer. I mean, the government, uh, the taxpayer, right. the government, and we get to that. And usually I used not to go and try to panic them because I know some of them were skeptical. I used to take facts. So I use, I had a plot which shows uh, ocean rise, you know, how's our, and I used to say, look, you can make your own judgment. This is actually taken from satellite. It's actual fact and look up how it's changing, you know, that, that going up. And if that continue, particularly if they are from Florida, your district is going to be underwater in 50 years from now. Uh, the other one, I remember very clearly, I had a friend who was a Congressman from Texas you know, he was visiting us. So we connected him with a farmer in Texas in real time via the internet. And the farmer was explaining to him how things have impacted him with the temperature change and how he is using the satellite data to help him to irrigate and the moisture in his field and how. So by bringing to them things which are not necessarily very scientific, but something down to earth, you know, that they can associate with, uh, they became believers, you know, doing it. and it's important for all of you or the people listening today when you talk with politicians and, and to tell them that look, and particularly if you get that ap application called the, the app called Eyes on Earth, it will actually show them the changes which are happening on our planet. So I try to avoid being a panicked person. I avoid telling them, look, the sky is going to fall and tomorrow we're going to be all cooked, you know, because of climate, because it's not true. It's a very slow process. So, uh, so by giving them scientific facts and just facts, uh, I was able to convince many of them. Now, some of them you'll never be able to convince, but that's the way life is. But, uh, but many of them are pretty convinced if you can talk to them with something practical that they can associate with. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Rula Abdel Masih is asking a question about Titan. She's saying, um, do you think there could be some sign of simple life existing there? And have we done enough sampling on Titan? Well, it's possible. Uh, I mean, that's a very good question. And that's why we are sending that drone to Titan, you know, uh, in about seven, eight, nine years. Uh, the challenge is that Titan is very, very cold. Mm -hmm. You know, the temperature on Titan is 50 degrees absolute. So that's like minus 107. It's colder than Antarctica by far. And the water on Titan is all frozen. I mean, really, the rocks, you know, the rock. However, so, so our kind of life is unlikely to be on Titan. However, you know, keeping our mind open, like scientists need to keep them up, it might be a different kind of life. It might be a life that can live in very, very cold, you know, environment. Uh, again, to give you an example, uh, when I was a kid, when I was studying biology, 
uh, we used to be told that you need sunlight, you know, for the cells to evolve. Mm -hmm. Then we discovered that there is life at the bottom of the ocean, way down where there is no light. And the reason life evolved there is because the heat coming from the vents, what we call the volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean. So the heat, the fact that there was water, organic material and heat, that changed our thinking of how life evolved, you know, because of the heat instead of the sunlight. So who knows, you know, we might find that there is a different way of evolution on Titan, which could lead to life, which might not be the same as our life, but it will be something similar. Yes. Um, can you briefly answer Talat Qutan's question? He's asking about the black hole. Well, uh, I mean, uh, no question, we know that black hole exists, uh, you know, because we see that with telescope, we don't see the black hole, but we see things around them. And what these black holes are is basically mass which have collapsed. And there is so much mass that even light cannot escape. Mm -hmm. So we believe now that at the center of every galaxy, including our galaxy, there is a black hole and that's what's holding the stars, you know, tied together. So in a sense, black holes are really enabling us, you know, to survive in a sense of staying within our galaxy. Dr. Saleh and Suli to unmute. Hello, Lubna. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lashi, for your explanations. We have learned a lot from you today. I want to follow up on the question that uh, Mr. Mokhtar uh, asked you. For many years now, we have been talking about global warming. I remember Al Gore worked very hard, produced a movie, tried to sensitize people to global warming but you just indicated that things are still getting worse. Uh, and my question to you is what more can be done to sensitize world leaders to the urgency of dealing with global warming? Yeah. We don't seem to be making much progress. Yeah. No, Dr. Saleh, that's a very good question that you have. Uh, well, and I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, in the sense that I'm seeing like the, the, the big meeting which happened in Scotland recently where the different nations came together and at least they acknowledge, you know, what is happening now. They made commitment. We have to wait and see if they can meet that commitment. So the, the biggest thing that I think we, we keep to do is to really keep urging the politician, but also industry to develop the capability which are for green energy. Uh, where we can depend less and less on oil emission. Uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, there is no way I can tell you, no matter what people say, there is no way suddenly we're going to use uh, electric cars, everybody using electric cars or everybody using solar panels, you know, and so on. But hopefully over the next 10, 15 years, by keeping people aware of the seriousness of the issue and we are seeing it. I mean, I live in Southern California. I remember 20, 30 years ago, though the climate was a lot more, how to say, normal than we see today, you know, the heat waves and, and the rain and so on. So really we're messing around, you know, with our, uh, with our uh, environment or our climate. So I think by encouraging and doing investment in green energy, in principle, I would say in the next 20 years, we can start depending more and more, I mean, uh, using less and less, you know, gasoline, which is a major contributor to the carbon dioxide. The other one is methane. Methane turned out to be even worse than carbon dioxide. We don't emit as much, but it's a worse greenhouse gas. And methane is emitted from leaks in pipelines and, uh, and oil manufacturing and so on. And, and being able to monitor where the emission is happening. Matter of fact, I'm involved now helping uh, the Environmental Defense Fund to develop and fly a satellite which map worldwide where the methane is being emitted. Therefore, we can tell the companies, hey, you are, there are leaks of methane in your pipeline. And you know, there, are, there will be hopefully rules you know, to, to stop that leak. So we are doing things in it, but it's, going, it's really a it's collective conscientiousness that we have to take care of our planet. And then we have to leave a good planet for our children and our grandchildren. I think by doing that and bringing the technology and the science to help it, I think we can address it. So I'm optimistic about that happening. 
Thank you, thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Nsouli. Um, we have several thank you notes for sharing your insights today, Dr. Lashi from Mohammed Majzoub, Sadna Sharma, and our Consul General in LA is saying he's very proud of the Lebanese accomplishments. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna have to end it here, Dr. Lashi. Um, what a fantastic story you shared with us today. Uh, you have both an inspiring and a remarkable life journey. Thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, well, Lubna, thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you for the audience, for all your questions. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a proud American, but I'm also a proud Lebanese American. And yes. I'm proud of my ancestry in Lebanon. Yes. And uh, I wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Everyone in the audience, I am so grateful you joined us today. Please don't forget to connect with us again. Unheard Stories is a monthly event. It falls on the last Saturday of every month. You don't want to miss my next month's conversation with our exceptional guest, author and professor, May Rihani. Ms. Rihani grew up in a house where daily conversations revolved around literature and poetry. Amin Rihani and Walt Whitman and where cultures and languages merged. She served several leadership positions in Washington, DC, planning and implementing educational projects, underscoring the interdependence of girls' education, their physical health, and their economic productivity. Mary Hani traveled to more than 40 countries, designing and implementing programs to establish gender equity, girls' right to education, and women empowerment all the while rallying global organizations to support her mission. She wrote several books, among them poetry in both English and Arabic. Please don't forget to register. It will be on the last Saturday of March, which is March 26th. To watch past events and know about our future ones, you can follow me on social media. Thank you for bringing us into your home and making us part of your Saturday. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>